Hello and welcome back and I want to continue going down memory lane and take a little look at a little bit of Synology's past. I want to talk about the DS209 Plus 2. This was one of their early generation devices and this is going to be part of my series of kind of nostalgic, retro, whatever you want to call it, look backs on top of the brands that we talk about here on the channel. And this was when Synology kind of gained a lot of their rhetoric. Released in the end of 2008, this device retailed for about 250 to 300 quid at the time. And it was one of their first devices, although not the first, that arrived with DSM evolving into more like what we know today. It arrived with DSM 2.2, and it was when DSM moved from a simple file structure system to something more evolved, a more graphical user interface based um, uh, software that you could interact with in a way that wasn't just download, upload, download, upload. It wasn't just about backups. It was taking advantage of things that at that time were just not around, um, making network server devices, basically making any connected device network efficient, using some of the old storage you'd have knocking around and pooling that storage into a RAID volume or via external storage and sharing those USB drives that even as late as 2008 was starting to gather dust in drawers. So what was it that made this device so special? Why is it something that Synology are so proud of? Well, a couple of things. First and foremost, it was one of the earliest generation devices in their Plus series. Their Plus series was always their heavy hitters, their feature devices, and even though the hardware inside this right now may seem quite laughable 12 years down the line. It's at the time was pretty darn good. Uh, it involved with a CPU, and yes, I am looking off camera because I've never heard of it. It was a Freescale MPC 8533. That was a 1.06 gigahertz CPU. Now, bear in mind, this was 2008. We really took seriously the frequencies right the way down to the decimal place in that way. 1.06 gigahertz. It also arrived with 512 megabytes of memory, which was substantial for the time in terms of NAS. When you look at the majority of NAS is being released around that year, and also the year before and the year after, it was quite common to see devices arriving with you know, 64 or 128 megs. So the idea of a, a NAS arriving with half a gig of memory, and this was a NAS, a storage device, was substantial. Why that big memory increase? DSM. Arriving at DSM 2.2, this device still supports all the way up to DSM 4.2, released many, many years later, with us currently in DSM 6, all these years later on. This arrived with a lot of the building blocks of what made the two base series from Synology so popular. Because although Synology has had a range of one and two and four and eight and racked out mountain devices for more than a decade, clearly, it was the two bays that really made their mark. It was where a lot of the PC editorial websites, a lot of the techies, and a lot of users suddenly realized that this technology wasn't a fad anymore. It was when we realized that network attached storage wasn't just a hard drive that lived on the internet, on the network. It was something you could interact with. You had user accounts, you had different you know, permissions, collateral, you had applications, you could tinker with it. It was something for home and business. And although it hadn't really evolved in terms of things like surveillance or in terms of things like Plex Media Server, which was basically non-existent, um, it was still a platform where your storage drives were doing more than just counting megabytes. Now, why would you give, why would you buy something like this at the time? Two key words efficiency and price a number of you these days argue that what is the point buying a nas when you could just use an old pc and leave it on 24 7 which is true and pcs these days are far more efficient than they were back then but back in 2008-9 pcs were nowhere near as efficient as they would one day become and the amount of dust the number of us that have had to clean out dust inside our pc rigs because although you had liquid cooling PC rigs and stuff like that at that point, they, they weren't what they are today. And having these devices on 24-7 for days, weeks, or months at a time would utilize significantly more power, would be far more uh, would cause far more degradation on the internal hardware, and ultimately was not as cost efficient. This provided an alternative. Because 250 to 300 quid is still quite a lot of money, but 
to make all of your multimedia accessible over the internet and in your local area environment via, you know, your console, or there were no smart TVs back then, um, you had a device that gave that to you in a user-friendly fashion with that graphical user interface. And at that point, this was real new tech. And at that price point, this kind of power for back then was actually quite good. I mean, these days we're used to our mobile phones having huge amounts of power that would dwarf this, but we can't live our life like that, can we? But even when you take a closer look at it, there's a lot of features and functionality of this device which have continued all the way into 2020 with Synology. So if we take a look at the chassis, we can see at the top four LED lights there for the status, the network interface connection, and the two LEDs for the individual drives. Underneath that, we have a USB port with a one-touch copy button. So one-touch copy was still around then with USB drives because they knew at that point that USB backup still served as another tier of our backup strategy. On top of that, at the, I'm sorry, below that, we can see an eSATA port. Now bear in mind, this eSATA port is not being utilized as an expansion port as we're used to today with Synology devices. USB 3 was in its infancy at that point and frankly, you know, just the, the expense of it was just not something you could factor into this and still keep the device affordable. But eSATA was in its prime, like Firewire and connections of that era. It was giving speeds that USB could only dream of. And with eSATA arriving at that point with the same speeds as SATA, which I believe at that point was SATA 2, you were looking at 3 gigabits per second connectivity there, which would then scale up as SATA scaled as well. We've also got a power button and more LEDs. And of course, the design and indeed the font hasn't changed. They're on the bottom with DS209 Plus 2. This is a second revision of that device, making it even better than the last, something we've seen before in the 2016 series as well. We look at the rear, we can see a couple of more USB ports, of course. And again, USB 2, maybe even USB 1. I'll have to double check those specs there. Maybe it's on screen as I speak. And of course, that LAN connection there, meaning that gigabit connection giving us that 100 megabytes per second, which that CPU and memory back then were giving us, which is good to know. But there's no trays, as you can see. And we don't have, at this point, the Synology logo being the ventilation point of this device. We've only got that little embossed metal sticker there on either side. So again, we hadn't quite reached that point where we had that ventilated side panel. I think it was about 2010 that started appearing. But ultimately, in terms of uh, like Synology's NAS history, particularly of two bays, this is a very, very key development because the two bays ended up being the talking point. They ended up being the NAS that were both affordable and often the most powerful that you could get within that range if you're a home user or a, pro, or a prosumer, or we're looking at a solution where up until that point, your options were getting a brainless network dongle and attaching storage to it without a usable management interface, or you had to go for something big. And at that point, that's when you had big, big corporate brands within the world of network storage that owned everything. They kind of they sat on their laurels and allowed companies like Synology to persevere and grow within that time frame. And this is a big part of that because this got them the exposure they needed. But if you disagree, let me know in the comments. I hope you've enjoyed this video. We will be talking about more retro NAS appliances along, of course, with the newest releases in the, this field of technology and other data storage. If you've enjoyed it, click like, click subscribe to learn more about all things new and old in the world of data storage. And I will see you next time.